this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. This episode of Built to Sell Radio is brought to you by Mass Mutual. Mass Mutual helps business owners identify and prioritize the protection and financial strategies that are critical to the ongoing success of your business. With understanding the value of your business as the foundation, they can help address the core planning pillars, which includes your family, business, future, and team, so you can help minimize risk and protect what is most likely your largest asset. Every business owner will leave their business at some point in time, either by design or by default. Let Mass Mutual help you stay focused on the task at hand, running your business, while together in concert with your trusted advisors, help to create a financial roadmap for long-term success and an eventual exit that's on your terms. Visit massmutual.com. So do you remember Sully, the guy who landed the plane on the Hudson River? He had done everything there is to do in an airplane. He was even a trainer of other pilots, yet he had never had the opportunity to land an airplane on the Hudson River. He had one shot at greasing that landing and he nailed it. And when it comes to selling your business, you've got one shot. One shot to make sure you punch above your weight when you go to sell your company. One shot to make sure you don't make some of the most common mistakes that entrepreneurs make when they sell their business. That's why I wrote the book, The Art of Selling Your Business. It's a field guide for anyone looking to sell their company. You can get it along with some gifts for my listeners at builttosell.com slash selling. Okay, so what are you gonna do when you get an acquisition offer that does not meet your expectations? First of all, it's been flattering to be offered, but if it's not where you want it to be, how do you react? My next guest, Wes Matthews, did a great job, I think, of somehow threading that needle. Reacting with enough emotional vigor that got the attention of the acquirer, but at the same time, kept them on the line. So much so that he ultimately doubled the value that he got for his business through some savvy negotiation and four or five rounds or turns of the letter of intent. Again, I'll let him describe that entire process to you. Also listen for the way Wes got his business ready to sell in the first place. In particular, four things that he did to drive up the value of his company. He talks a little bit about pricing and the importance of recurring revenue, how he kept his customers sticky, and what financial freedom meant to Wes. Here to tell you the entire story is Wes Matthews. Wes Matthews, welcome to Build to Sell Radio. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Tell me about high-level marketing. You guys were in the digital marketing space. Yeah, so high-level marketing. uh, We are a digital marketing uh, agency focused around small to mid-sized businesses, really entrepreneurial ran businesses. So we don't, we don't work with any large fortune 500 company. Um, the idea is any small business that has an entrepreneurial spirit, we typically can come in and add value by way of website design, uh, redevelopment, organic optimization, SEO, getting found on Google naturally and pay-per-click advertising. So all the paid areas in Google, um, the company is really about driving leads and uh, success to to a small business by helping them grow. And we were able to establish a uh, quantifiable value of how much a customer is paying us and what we're delivering on the back end in terms of leads. Um, I felt at a time when I started the company, there's a lot of companies out there that do marketing, but they never defined an outcome. And I'm all about the outcomes. And uh, we were able to, to do that. And so how did I started you, the company and grew the company. How did you charge for your services? I mean, were you, were you being paid some sort of success fee based on how many leads you generated? Or was it just time and materials? How did you charge it for your time? Yeah, it's sort of like time and materials. So like early on, we created like the A, B, or C package, right? Like the good, the better, the best. I think we called it silver, gold, platinum to make it easier to understand on the customer um, perspective. So as that evolved into today... Uh, you know, it, it's really, ch- it's changed because if you have a plumber, say that has 10 trucks on the road or a hundred trucks on the road, uh, they're going to have different visions and, and values that they need to establish when it comes to lead generation. So 
we started with the packages early on and then it became like, how do we take our services and create a custom package to that customer to understand what outcome they're looking to, uh, to have? So for example, if they're like, Hey, we need a hundred leads. We have the ingredients for the recipe. We just got to come up with that recipe. So that's how we base our, our, our model. Uh, but really hours and services that we're providing for customers. Got it. So if I came to you, so if I came to you for a hundred leads or I said, look, I, I need to get a hundred leads a week, you yep. would sort of be able to back end into that how much they need to spend in the way of Correct. search uh Correct. All the different your paper click and so forth. It, yeah, I mean, we've really, you know, over the course of the last 11 and a half years, we've been really good at doing that. When we first started early on, it was a gamble. We won sometimes and we, we got our ass handed to us sometimes because we're doing a lot of work for, say, $500 a month and the customer's getting 100 leads and getting so much value. So it was kind of like the the R&D through the first five years of what that is, of what that was. And then we sort of started to perfect to where we're at today. Uh, so you started to find the right balance between, okay, this, this guy needs yeah. X number of leads Correct. that corresponds with Y in terms yeah. of hours and time. Yeah. God, who's the we you, you co-founded this business. Is there a partner involved? Yeah. So, uh, started the company, um, back in 09. So my business partner and I, John Bowerman, uh, he's the CTO of the company and, we had this great yin yang relationship. So I was sort of the sales end of it, the operation side, the customer side. And he was this technical genius that was sort of like this hidden gem. And he was lacking a Wes and I was lacking a John because I, I, it was very hard to find a reliable software developer or somebody who I could count on for delivery. And he was sort of doing really great at that, but he lacked a true sales guy and a true operations guy that wanted to come together. So we we met up through a different project I put together and yeah I mean we partnered right away and still partners till this day. How'd you guys so how'd you guys split the uh, the equity stuff? Did you each kick in a little bit of money? To, to sweat equity fifty fifty? Like how did you guys structure that? Yeah, so I had a, I had my own company and he also had his own company. So little companies that were both trying to grow and scale, doing a couple hundred grand each in revenue. Um, I was actually sending deals over to him for him to fulfill. And I was giving him a percentage of the contract uh, value. It got to a point where, with me, I said, look, I, I think I just had my first child. He had a child. We're the same age. And I said, look, why don't we just partner? I have a little office here. You have a little office there. Let's go 50-50. I'll take my client base. We'll take your clients. He had a developer. Let's just put it together and let's grow this together. You know, let's just, we're, we're young, you know, we're 26. Like, let's just, let's just get after it and, and do it. So it was my sort of proposal. He's like, yeah, you know what? Like, let's try it. And uh, fortunately, I, you know, the first month was a little bit like, let's figure this out. But we were profitable that first, first, second month after partnering together. So we each put in a dollar. Um, and your respective assets being your client lists and so forth. Um, yeah, time, right? I mean, we were, uh, we were 100% both all in. You know, he had some affairs like he wrapped up. There was a couple projects he partnered with with some guys. But I think he knew, you know, he had a, he had a CMS, um, a, a content management platform, very similar to WordPress. And um, he was like, I want to really focus and build this thing out. I want it to be the, the best and the greatest. So it was this perfect storm and serendipity for us to come together at that time. Um, yeah, and it, and it worked out. And that was in 2009. And, and you sold in, in yep. this year, 2021. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, closed the deal at the end of February of this year. Got it. Got it. And what did you get your revenues up to uh, before you sold? Like to give people a sense, you were a couple hundred grand when you came together yeah, sure. with John and then sort of how big did you get before you sold? Yeah. So uh, end of 2020, uh, we did 6.5 million in revenue. So as an agency, um, sometimes numbers are a little skewed, but that was all HLM revenue. Any third party cost, meaning Google spend, third party advertising, we always put on the vendor direct. So we did 6.5 revenue uh, all into HLM. What does HLM stand for? High level marketing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't make that connection. Yeah, no, got sorry it. about that. Got it. Got it. Right. Because some agencies are like, yeah, our revenue is 100 million bucks. And then you you actually get underneath the covers. It's like, yeah, we yeah. spent 90 million on, on advertising. And Correct. our revenue is actually yeah. 10 million. Yeah. 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 Correct. Exactly. So you're six and a half million. And I never, want to, I never want to play that. Yeah pure, pure revenue. Yeah. Um, we did everything in house. We didn't send anything overseas and we ended, you know, 
My first employee I hired when I partnered with John, I uh, hired her from a Craigslist ad right out of college. She's still with us today. She's still on wow. the company. And, wow. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride, but, you know, we grew the company to about 49 employees at the time we, we closed the deal. Got it. And, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. As you look back over that journey, um, mm -hmm. clearly you guys added a lot of value to the business from the early days when you put in a dollar each to when you sold. Right. Like, are there one or two things that, that you look back on now as being real value drivers? Like this decision yeah. really made a huge <clears throat> difference for us as you look back and reflect. Yeah, for sure. So a couple of things. I mean, the one major thing that stands out um, early on, I was like, when I, I knew a lot of people back then that lost their businesses or that were struggling because they would have like five to 10 major accounts. And when the market shifted like in 09, they lose their five accounts, companies bankrupt, they're out of business. So when I set out for this quest, my I, I said I wanted to charge a client a setup fee and a monthly reoccurring fee forever. So that was the goal from day one. So looking back hindsight, there's nothing more valuable than reoccurring revenue. And we drove that number over over a half a million dollars a month um, in, in reoccurring revenue. So that, that number one is the most valuable. Um, number two, uh, process. So I had a lot of uh, people around me that were like, man, you guys are a small company at you know, 6.5 million, but you guys, you guys have systems and processes. Like you could be a, a several hundred million dollar business. And I, I think it's just because we had great processes in place, you know, clear, precise, you know, our production process, our, our customer intake to life cycle of customer, how we fulfill and then manage ongoing. So the reoccurring revenue, uh, the processes, and then our technology. So like I mentioned early on, when I first partnered with John, he had this little CMS that he was working on. I mean, over the course of 11 years, the value we built into that piece of technology and the things that it could still potentially do to the future, that was a huge asset. I mean, that was the big differentiating factor between us and uh, another web company out there. It's, you know, because what do you have? I mean, at the end of the day, if you just have your customers, and your customers can go over here. We had stickiness. They were on our own proprietary platform. And I, I kind of use the analogy like, you can't just, you know, if we're dating, like you can't just dump me on a Thursday and like we never see each other again. Like we have to sit down and go through a, a divorce and we have to talk about this. And, and this, this sort of pushed that and moved that forward where, you know, because we're at a time where digital marketing, like, Everybody knows what digital marketing is. Customers are getting calls from all over the place all the time, trying to pull you away from your company. And this was a little protector that kind of helped us build a lot of value, the stickiness of that. So I would say those three things. And then people. Um, I, th I think I, I built a rock star, all-star leadership team, and I had key people within the business that created a lot of value. You know, I, I think early on, when I started this journey, like I was the guy, right? I'm beating the drum. I'm going out there. I'm driving it. But then I finally realized it took me a while. I joined EO and just kind of grew as a leader and as an individual to realize like I need to build up my team. And they were the true real asset of, of the organization. So those four things were really important. I want to dig into a couple of those if I can, Wes. Talk to me about the technology. So um, you, you refer to it as a CMS is that right? Yeah, content. Or, yep, content management system. Yep. Okay, so you're you're effectively white labeling someone and someone CMS and then edit, like create it, making it your own, or, or did you actually build the CMS from scratch? Yeah, so we actually built it from scratch because what was available in the marketplace is really clunky. It's cumbersome. It's hard to use. So we mm -hmm. took the idea that what if we created our own and made it really easy to use? So we use the acronym Mice. And it stands for manage your content easily. And mm. we want to create a solution for a small business to say, look, you don't need a, an advanced degree or to understand how, you know, technology to, to go in the back end of your website to make edits. So that was really the foundation of why we did what we did. And then also the idea around this is our system. So people will adopt our system and, and get to know our system. They won't want to go elsewhere. Um, yeah. So for people who are not familiar with sort of content management, systems like me, uh, if, if I've got a website sure. and I own a, a plumbing company, 
and I've got a website and I want to run a special offer today. Uh, God knows why a plumbing company would want to run a special offer, but bear with me. I could, I right. would, even if I wasn't a technical guy or gal, I could log into your CMS and, and, and make a change to my website. Is that? Absolutely. That, that okay. is correct. Yep. Got it. So and we always, also, I wanted to provide the solution. I want to provide the solution to an individual to say, look, if you want to do it yourself, the system will allow you to do it yourself, but we are also behind it as a company. So if you want to shoot us a message or call us and say, hey, I need this coupon done for a 50% off a drain cleaning, we're happy to do that for you. I, I, I'm a, I like options and I wanted to give my customer base those options as well. Did they get... Was it Was it cheaper for them if they chose to do it themselves as opposed to having you guys do it? So that's that's what everybody thinks, right? Because if we say, hey, it's $125 an hour you know, to pay HLM to, sure. to do this for you. Um, obviously, if they sit down and do it themselves, but that's taking away from doing more plumbing jobs. And, you know, I, so I think giving them that option uh, w was a great solution. So what we would find is most customers in the beginning would do that. And they'd say, man, there's so many changes or this is a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Can you guys take care of it? So early when we started on, as long as customers were paying their bill on time and they're paying us a monthly fee, I would allow a certain amount of hours per month where we would just do it for free for the customer just to add, you know, to do it now with a value add. So unless somebody was really abusing it and saying, Hey, you know, more than an hour or so a month, we would start to charge them. But normally it's like, Hey, you're, you're within the HLM family. We're going to take care of it because that's just a, you know, kind of like a surprise and delight to say, Hey, normally we charge 125 an hour, but John, you're such a great guy and you're so busy and we love you. We're just going to do it for free. It's like, Ooh, that's, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so the system, the content management system would allow you to, or the, the user or you or their, mm -hmm. the owner to manage their website. Would it also allow them to manage some of their social media campaigns and, and assets? Yeah, for sure. So again, when we launched in 2009, like social media, like Facebook just launched, you know, things are just <laughs> like social media just became a thing. So what we did with this mice technology is, you know, until today, we evolved it. So where it stands today, a customer, that plumber can log into the back end and actually have a complete dashboard to see where their investment's going, you know, where they rank on Google, what is their Google Maps doing, how many leads they receive. So really it's like a very intuitive dashboard that the customer knows every little thing about their website rolled into this dashboard. Um, so that's really where mice came from and what's it evolved into today, which, how did is, you which guys is awesome. So one of the things that's going through my mind is like, in a way you were competing with the likes of HubSpot and Infusionsoft yeah. and these massive like unicorn companies that have like more money than they could ever sure. possibly throw at a problem. How did you guys as a small independent business kind of keep up with the investments they were making to make your CMS like competitive? Number one, you know, I, I tip my hat to my partner, John Bowerman. I mean, the guy's a unicorn. I mean, I've been in this industry now for, I mean, like we said, we started in 2009. I was doing some things before then until today. Um, I've been part of great organizations. So I've met a lot of talented people. I mean, John is still extremely high on that list on what his capabilities are. So how he was able to bob and weave and, and right into the technology where it needs to get to today. But I also feel like HubSpot, some of these businesses like, we started, I feel, with the most important asset of any business, which is the website. So HubSpot was never doing websites. They're, they're a stack on service. And so we really got people at the ground floor to say, look, if you're going to make investments, I don't care what you do, people are going to go to your website. Your website's got to be dialed in. And none of those guys touch websites. So that was our, our foot in the door, um, is delivering a world-class website that, quite frankly, I mean, nobody... Nobody was really delivering. And even so to this day, I think we deliver at a whole nother level in terms of the value and the price that we provide for our customers. Wes, I got to ask, you know, at some point along the way, did you ever feel vulnerable to John holding his technical prowess over you? and saying, Wes, we got to renegotiate here. I'm adding a truckload of value to this business. You don't even know how to turn on the CMS, <laughs> let alone like build it out to compete with HubSpot. Did you ever feel like I'm like sort of a sense of dread that that conversation was coming? 
No, not at all. Because I think that you could build the best technology, the best widgets in the world, but it's it's the sales aspect, the operational aspect of getting those customers to use it. So the technology itself is a great value if you can get people to it to to use it. Um, I almost feel it's opposite, where it was me driving the business, getting the people in the door. So again, we really had this good relationship to say, I'm driving the value of bringing in the customers and, and building the company, yet here's this powerful software. And we really just kind of came together and had that mutual respect to say, I know what you're capable of. I know what you're capable of. Look, was it all roses the last 11 and a half years? No, but I think one of the, the things that you know really helped us as business partners was, you know, I was never like, I'm not a greedy guy. I'm not like, I need to have 51% or you're doing this or, you know, you work two more hours than me this week. And like, we've been fortunate not to get there. I'm sure there's been feelings on both sides, but I think when you strip all that away, I'm a, I'm a over communicator. I'm not scared of tough conversations. I really don't have a filter. So I kind of give myself a lot of credit where if things were bothering me, I'd bring it up to him. And, you know, I had to chip away at him. He's more, you know, and I could kind of get a sense of when he was getting irritated with me. And I would just say, hey, man, I, I think you're getting irritated about this. Let's talk about it. So mm -hmm. I feel like I always wanted to win together with John in this business. And I never cared more or less. I said, we're, we're doing this together. I guess it's kind of like a, my marriage, you know, and, and I, I think I've used that analogy with him a couple of times. I'm like, look, I mean, outside of your wife, I'm the closest thing to you. Same with my my wife. And, you know, it's a give and take relationship. And fortunately for me, I've grown a lot since I started in this industry. And I joined EO organization, uh, global organization. But in Detroit, it's kind of like a, a hundred entrepreneurs that are all going through the same thing. So I've been able to really grow and constantly learn. But yeah, we both had that vision of let's just let's grow this thing together and not get in the weeds and nitpick. So that's awesome. I also want to go back to, you, you, you mentioned the four things that you did to drive a lot of value, the recurring revenue, the process, the technology, the people. I want to go all the way back to the recurring revenue for a second. You charged a setup fee. Tell me a little bit more about what went into that decision. For sure. So, you know, one of the things that was really important for us is most of the work we do from a web perspective, the heavy lifting is in the front. So we started off selling, we'd always sell the website and then we'd sell a digital marketing package behind the website. Early on, we said, we're not doing digital marketing for a customer because we want the stickiness of getting the website on our platform. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, <clears throat> it's almost like order, you know, working with a, with a, a, a contractor for a home edition. Like you pay us half up front for the materials and the time you pay the rest when we're done. And then we were hoping to squeeze a little profit out of that because our profit really began seven to nine months after we closed in that monthly reoccurring revenue. So, our, so we, we set the foundation up in the company saying, we're going to go all in and do such a great job early on and really drive the value because I'm going to retain this customer for life. And we saw some customers that we signed 11, 10 years ago that are still customers today. So, our retention rate over the course of 11 and a half years, I mean, we're sitting at about 90% now, but I always shot for like one and a half percent churn year over year. So, I mean, we're, we're a digital marketing agency retaining 88% of our, our revenues. So we worked really, really hard to make sure client satisfaction is just at the highest, highest level it could be. So retention, just to be clear, 88% year over year. So you're retaining 88% of your revenue that you started with each year. Correct. That's awesome. correct. Good for you. Obviously a valuable service. One of the things that, that I think a lot about in the way of setup fee is that the bigger the setup fee or the upfront kind of payment, whatever you're, you're sort of characterizing it is in a recurring revenue model, uh, the stickier your customers, because they're going to, they're going to make a financial investment in becoming a customer and therefore they're going to be stickier long-term. Equally, it also makes it harder for your sales guys and gals to get them on the platform because there's an upfront payment. Um, did you, did you settle at 500 bucks? Did you try a thousand? Did you try 250? Like, was there some, was there some experimentation there or was 500 the kind of, how, yeah. like, how did you get to 500? For sure. So when we first started early on, I mean, we were selling packages for $75 a month 
And what I learned early on, it was that was such an insignificant amount of money where nobody took it serious. The second I raised those fees a couple hundred bucks, we started getting deals. And what I learned right away is because people like if they're going to spend 75 bucks a month, they're like, this can't be effective. Like, why am I going to sign up for this? And, and I learned that early on. Um, hmm. That was probably one of the best learnings I've, I've had. Um, so what, what ended up happening is when we got a little bit more sophisticated and, you know, financially and looking at gross profit margin, like that's how we then established the pricing for the packages around how much time we're committing. Um, yeah, it's, it, um, the setup fee. So my, my big take early on, and even with the sales team, my goal was to, I want to build the monthly reoccurring model because if you're charging a setup fee and the setup fee was for a website, so it wasn't like you're paying a setup fee just to get into our system. It's like, you're getting a world-class website. It's a lot easy. It's really hard. So let me give, let me give an example. And I, and I explain this to my sales team. It's if it's 500 a month and it's $6,000 for the entire year, it's much easier to get somebody to spend 500 a month and to then roll them into a new contract moving forward than to get them to pay 6,000 today. And then next year, I have to go through the cycle of selling you again for $6,000. I'm essentially going to train you to pay 500 a month, see the value, and you're going to fit that within your budget. And then we're going to help grow and scale that monthly number. So it's just an easier transition and an easier conversation to have. Because even, even me or anybody, it's like 6,000. Like, okay, like let's, let's think about this. Let's talk about it. When you're paying that 500 a month and it's business as usual, it's a completely different mindset. But you also charge the setup fee. Why not? Okay, so let me ask you a different Why not drop the setup fee and say, look, 500 bucks a month, I'll wait to the races. Because there's there are hard costs associated with you know the website itself. I mean, I think just our barrier to entry project. Um, let's let's look back a couple months or even today. It's about sixty to eighty hours of work. You know, so there's real costs associated with that. So those costs have to come from somewhere. So you're underwater on the deal until about you're underwater on the deal until about seven months, and then at, at month eight the margin starts to go up and, and at year two, year three, year four, the relationship, it's really very profitable. Yeah. That's how we started. We've obviously since evolved from there and kind of cleaned some things up, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly where we started. Correct. That's great. I'd love to dig into process a little bit because I think everybody's read Michael Gerber's book and they all know about the, the kind of work on not in, but I hear a lot from, from folks who, uh, want to build processes like I, I just I just don't have the time like my like stuff yeah. changes in our company too frequently mm -hmm. I got to rewrite the processes all the time I you know I don't I don't want to spend my day writing processes maybe react to that kind of commenter yeah so I think we ran very chaotic for the first four years of the business right very entrepreneurial I'm a visionary guy I'm like I kind of describe myself to people like I have four kids. So I, I don't know if you ever watched the movie Wreck-It Ralph, but I'm kind of like no. Wreck-It Ralph. Like I'll bust through the door. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to disrupt things and I'm, but like, I'm not a process guy. Right. So fortunately my partner was a process guy. So I think in terms of partners and who you're hiring, hire smarter people that can be effective in areas you're not. Um, mm -hmm. But I implemented this thing called EOS and I actually learned mm -hmm. about EOS through entrepreneur organization. And what that is, that's a, that's a, platform for entrepreneurs to manage a business because we're all crazy entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and I was causing organizational whiplash and I, mean, I can have a conversation with somebody in 15 minutes and throw out 15 different ideas and they're like whoa 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 like let's so EOS changed the trajectory of my company because it does take this entrepreneur journey and put it into a process and with these processes, decisions were a lot easier to make in terms of how we run meetings, how we set goals for the organization, how do we improve process? I mean, it, it really makes you think deep in the business to understand what do we need to work on? You know, what are the top five things that we have to get right that are going to drive everything else? EOS changed my life. Honestly, I, that is the one thing that I, I think that if I wouldn't have adopted EOS, we may have blown up as a company and it would have been my fault hmm. because I'm a complete disruptor, um, not super organized. Um, 
you know, I, once, once one idea is like not even solidified, I'm on to the next thing. And I didn't realize it because look, I'm the CEO, I'm the entrepreneur and everybody's like, yes, yes, yes. But like, nobody would step up to me and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, yeah, yeah, you, you got to slow down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what EOS, EOS made me look in the mirror and realize like, damn, you know, all these problems we're having, it's not everybody else. It's, it's me. And I had to like, you know, so I think it was being vulnerable and, and like looking in the mirror and understanding, like, I'm the cause of all these problems and they're real. Pro so like that, that to me, like changed my entrepreneurial journey. So we were able to identify and go through like, okay, from a process standpoint, like we use Salesforce, we use some internal um, custom technology we wrote, but we were as a leader, as a CEO and the entrepreneur, I could say, Hey, like, I think that these are the most important. Who's going to do them? How do I add value? I only want to be in the strategic side of it. I don't want to be in the day to day. We hired around that. Not perfect, but you know, our systems are pretty tight, you know, from what we've That's invested awesome. in. And it also so helps to about... go ahead. Sorry. A little leg. No, no, I, I, I was going to take us in a, in a slightly different direction, which was going to be around what triggered you to want to sell. You're clearly a young guy. Yeah. If you're not watching this on yeah. video, Wes looks like he's just run a marathon or something like that. He's, nah. he's certainly uh, uh, young for having four kids. Uh, yeah. Why sell? What was the trigger? So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's not one thing. It's a, it's a combination of a lot of things. So I have 39, turning 40 this year. I have four kids, been married for 15 years. Um, if I look back in the entrepreneurial journey with high-level marketing, I didn't think it was going to last 10 years. Quite frankly, I didn't think it was going to last five years. And I hired a chief operating officer. Like we're I, Like, things are finally coming together. And then I remember, like, I came back from a trip in 2020, and my COO, like we, we operate our EOS system. We call them level 10 meetings. So we have this meeting board and I see this little item on this meeting board and it says virus discussion. And I said, what the hell is this? Whatever. So we start talking about this thing and he's like, there's this thing and it's going to be bad. And like, just, you know, pulling the fire alarm. I'm like, you got to be, you're out of your mind, you know, like. So we operate like that. Like I'm this crazy visionary. He's like the level headed, like run the business day to day. I didn't believe it, but I'm like, all right, I hired you to make these decisions. And then the, the week later, we're like shutting down the office and here comes COVID. So being a digital marketing company, we were already flexible with people. Like, I don't care if they work from home. As long as you get your shit done, I could care less where it is. So we're already familiar with Zoom. We're a digital company, had a great office in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Um, you know, so it gave me a lot of time to sit. I'm in my home office now. I've spent a lot of time here. And, you know, quite frankly, there's a lot of things I felt at high level marketing. My vision and dream of high level was always to be to sell the company for $100 million, to create $100 million of valuation. The last couple of years, I kept telling myself, it's not, this isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen because either A, because of me and the, the investments that we would have to make to continue to grow the organization were fierce. I mean, I was looking down the barrel of about a $1.5 million investment for people, some new process. And, you know, quite frankly, COVID, I had to start, you know, it just made, I spent a lot of time thinking like, who do, you know, what do I want? Like, wait, I always tell people like, even in business, like wave a magic wand and tell me where you want to be in 12 months from a lead perspective, from a marketing perspective. And I, I turned that same question onto me. And I thought about that every day and I never wanted to outright sell but I use a, an analogy, I actually use it this morning before this conversation is I feel like I'm a hockey guy. My son plays travel hockey. So I like the analogy around like, you know, if we're the Detroit Red Wings, you know, we're a good solid team. You've got the captain, you've got the assistant captain. Um, <clears throat> an average hockey player pay, plays 15 minutes in a game out of 60 minutes. In high level marketing, everybody's playing a 60 minute game. Everybody's exhausted. So even the best players are exhausted. And like, we're always just like pumping deals, getting new ones. And we're never like able to really take that investment to grow and scale. And I sat there one day and my job became protector, right? I, I was in COVID's happening. My team's freaking out. I'm kind of freaking out, but I got to show up all, you know, clean and proper. And I'm the fearless leader. Right. But I'm also like, shit, I, I you know, this is scary, right? I had, I'm in EO, so a lot of businesses were affected and revenues and 
our customers pay us monthly. You know, we lost, we had a small little dip, but nothing crazy. We really worked with our customers, did delayed payments and stuff, but we actually grew out of COVID. But I'm sitting there looking at everybody. I've got like 50 people, little Zoom heads on my thing. And I'm like, huh, like something's not right. Um, I'm just not feeling it anymore. And I started guess. I, I think as an entrepreneur, you're, you are your own worst critic. So I started questioning my ability as a CEO to take this company to the next level. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, you know, what am I good at? Like, what do I actually do? Uh, for this organization. And for me, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm like, give me the microphone. I, I, I'm a relationship guy. But like, getting in the weeds and doing this stuff, like, I want to bang my head against the wall. Like, that's not why I created this company. It's not, for me, it's going against the grain. I mean, I think I played 70 rounds of golf last year. Like, I had nothing to do. I'm like, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so a lot of those emotions around it, and, and I always like had this vision in my mind, so continuing on that hockey analogy, so with the hockey, you have, a, you have the all-star game, right? Where the all-star game is you take two of the best players from every team, and then you're a badass team. And I felt like high-level marketing is such like this hidden gem in West Bloomfield, and we got to get out there. So I, gotta, I always get calls all the time. You want to sell your company, you want to sell your company, and I'm like, kick rocks, kick rocks. This one guy emailed me out of the blue, and I must have been bored that day. I don't even know why I responded to this guy. I hit, I clicked the link and I saw him on LinkedIn and I go, this guy looks like Grant Cardone. So Grant Cardone is the author of 10 X, this freaking crazy sales guy. I love the guy. And I said, I'm bored. Let me talk to this guy. So he, he calls me, his name's Todd Tasky, Potomac capital. He's bullshit with me. I'm like, I like this guy. Like this guy's like, he's, he's me. Like, I love this guy. And I said, you know, kick rocks. I'm not interested in selling. So he goes, okay. So, cause I said, here's the money I want. And it, it, if I want to be out of the business, like here's my number, because here's the number that I'll never have to think about work again. And I can just kind of do what I want to do. And I'm 39. I got a lot of years ahead of me, hopefully. And uh, a couple weeks later, he says, Hey, I met this guy in Alabama and you're going to love this guy or you're going to hate the guy. I don't know. He's like, would you be open to having a conversation? I said, sure. Long story short, me and this guy, we meet on zoom. And he's got almost the same size agency, but they're doing more revenue. And we just go, we start talking, we start having conversations. And, and the conversation started with uh, you know, just meeting each other. But like, I had three things that were really bugging me, like how we intake customers. It was kind of a debacle at the time. There's a lot of scrambling around. And guess what? They identified that two years ago and they fixed it. So like everything that was painting me as CEO entrepreneur, they had a solution for that they've already been through the last couple of years. And I'm looking across this guy and he's like, I'm like, this guy's a real CEO. Like he's everything I'm not like, he's a, he's just, he just looks the part and he just really wants to grow and make acquisitions. And I'm like, this is one of the first guys I've met in a long time that actually like impressed me. So then my mind's like, how could I work with this guy? Like, could I, could I support this guy? Because again, I've already mentally built the model in my head that I'm going to be chief revenue officer of my company one day and lead sales and like lead the relationships and big strategic things. So I had already created that model. So then I meet his chief operating officer and I'm like, I freaking love this guy. Like I have enough experience now in the last 15 years of meeting people with titles and what are they going to do? Like these guys are every day grinding in the business. All they care about is growing this company and everything. And so I'm looking at these two executives talking about the business and guess what they don't have. They don't have a Wes who's crazy. It's got knockout power. That's a relationship guy that can really lead the charge in sales. And they don't have a technology component in their business. Hmm. They do not have a CTO. They do not have their own proprietary technology. They have zero technology. They've been operating off WordPress and all these other things. So I'm like, I started paying this vision of, man, if, if, if we've got a CEO, a COO, a CRO and a CTO, and then we roll up all of these employees together, going back to my analogy around everybody getting exhausted, the resources are endless. The cultures were very similar. They're from Alabama. So there's a little bit difference in terms of, you know, just, just, just culture from by location. But I'm also like the big key thing for me was if we would have been in an office, this deal probably wouldn't have happened because in my mind, 
everybody's on zoom and i'm like you know we can probably pull this off because if sally logs she's going to log into a new zoom the next day like there's not a lot of disruption mm -hmm. you know and all these things started popping up and you know i don't know i, I think i'm a i'm a gut guy i'm a serendipitous guy like weird things happen to me but like everything that was painting me at that moment these guys had the solution for and i also look this is a lonely ass road as an entrepreneur and a ceo of your own company you know oftentimes i felt like i don't have the support you know it, it's it's hard to do it myself and again i go early on to when i partner with john i looked at john and said let's go all in 50 50 let's grow this together i used that same process with these guys and said man i see a hundred million dollar valuation coming together and there's a real opportunity to do that so for me the that was hey if I can take chips off the table today, partner with a larger company and celebrate the success and really dig in and help this company grow by adding what I want to do day in, day out, but then also be el eliminated from all the personal liability, you know, being the CEO and, and being responsible for everything. Like I felt that it was my time and I just acted on it and, you know, everything just sort of happened and fell into place. And yeah, I got kind so of a many crazy, questions, like, Wes. yeah, like, I'm sorry, I, I could talk about this. Like I'm, you know, things just, things, it, it just happened, you know, and it just yes. happened organically. And, and you know, look, I, I, I respect people. I respect entrepreneurs. I, I love the story. I love experience shares. And these guys are just hungry. And uh, yeah. All right. I got a ton of questions. So mm -hmm. let me start. Todd Tasky, you're the guy who reached out to you. Can you recall yep. what it was in his email that stood apart from all the other emails you'd got? In your own admission, you're getting emails all the time from people, hey, do you want to sell your business? Or do you want to sell yep. your business? Todd said something in that email that tweaked your curiosity. Yep. What was it? So I don't think it was anything like of great, like it wasn't very different. I actually want to go back and search it and find it now. Um, but I remember seeing his picture. And I think I just clicked on it and I saw his picture and he looked exactly like Grant Cardone. And at the time, I just finished reading 10X and I'm like literally just bored at my desk. Like, I'm just like, oh, I clicked on it. I think I clicked on LinkedIn. And I'm like, I just responded. He was like all over it. Take a call with me. Take a call with me. Like, okay. And then when I met him, I'm like, you know, he's not this like super, like he's not a suit. Like I've met a lot of guys from these huge private equity firms sure. and half the time I can't understand what they're saying. And it's just like not authentic. Todd was just like this authentic guy that I was having a conversation with. And I think it was just timing. Like, uh, honestly, I just happened to be sitting in my desk, click the link, we connected. And kudos to him because I basically told him, like, you're a good dude, but kick rocks and not those terms. Um, and, and kudos for him for actually following up when he says, there, yeah, I'm going to hook you guys up and see what happens. Mastermind. And, and had he been engaged by Bell Media, your acquirer, to find yeah. other businesses to sell? Yeah. So what happened is what I learned after the fact is they almost, they were very close to a deal, um, this Bell Media and this other company, and it fell through at the 11th hour. Mm -hmm. So Todd was working with this organization to find a suitor, and that's how he found me. One thing I failed to mention to you um, that I think would be helpful to the listeners and my relationship with my partner, um, you know, stressful, like COVID was stressful. Right. And I mean, just running the business in general, is stressful, you know, John, my business partner, he's the mastermind where a lot of people roll to him because he just solves problems. Like he can do anything. And, you know, he did come to me and he was kind of like waving the white flag. And he said something to me that kind of stuck with me. And he goes, man, if I had X amount of dollars, I'd just be done. And this was different. Like I could tell from his body language and I'm like, so when he said that to me, it was in my head of shit, maybe. And then that's when Todd connected and like all things started moving forward. So I kind of blame him for a little bit of putting it in my head. I'm moving forward. But then I started thinking to myself, like, look, I'm 39. Look, I mean, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, right? Like I want an outcome based on the business I built. And I think at some point diversification is key. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. to this point. So it's, yeah, we, we call it the freedom point. 
uh, which is the when the sale of your business would create enough liquid wealth that you could live comfortably for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. It, it, it makes it, you you kind of you get your first rung on Maslow's hierarchy of needs and say you you know I'm never going to worry about you know right. paying the mortgage, the kids' hockey fees, whatever. Right. What was that number for you? If you're comfortable sharing it, great. Yep. If you're not, maybe help me understand the yep. math that went into it for you. Boy, it was just a monetary yeah. number. Yeah, for sure. So you know, my number has always been ten million dollars, mm-hmm. um, and this got us part of the way there. And the reason why mm-hmm. I did that was because I still want motivation and I want the next big win. So this was enough to allow me to say, man, I really won. We created a viable business, a huge asset, kind of ring the bell of success, but it's also going to keep me hungry enough to really get it to the next phase to then hit that chapter of that 10 million. So I don't think personally at, at 39, I was ready to say, I don't even want that kind of money yet. Like I still want that mentality of like, you know, I want to grind for the next 10 years. Like I don't want to mail it in or just, um, it was kind of scary to get that kind of money at the time. And that's kind of why I structured the deal this way, to be honest with you. It might sound crazy, but it's what I did. No, it doesn't at all. So how did you structure the deal uh, for folks uh, to try to understand? Uh, yeah. Maybe just describe the structure. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, obviously in a deal, right. It's new to me, right. I got a lot of advisors, a lot of people around me. Um, you know, the first thing that happened was, you know, and, and a letter of intent came my way, right? Here's what we'll pay for your business. Here's what we think it's worth. I laughed at him. I said, sure, out of your mind. Like, let me tell you about what I'm worth. And, you know, so, um, you know, it, it, it was a lot of back and forth. And I had a mental, like I said, like, I don't know, as an entrepreneur, I'm a visionary, like I build mental models in my mind. So I had a number I was very specific on. And I wanted to be invested in the new company. I did not want to be CEO. I wanted to be CRO. I wanted to be personally let go of any fiduciary responsibility of old HLM. Um, and, I, and I want to maintain a 10% stake in new company because I think the opportunity is sell this again for over $100 million. And I'm okay um, you know, exiting the second time, working with right partners and, and really growing this. Um, that, that was part of where the deal, where I kind of manifested the deal to get to. Okay. So the LOI comes in before you, before you even open the LOI, do you have a, a, like a multiple of earnings that you think your company's worth? I know you, you had a number. Did, what did that equate to as a multiple of say profit? Well, like any entrepreneur, right? I'm like 20, 20 X, right? Like <laughs> we built so much value and you know, we're better than everybody. But realistically I was like, look, six to 12, depending on who it is, right? Because obviously we have some technology and some things. So it really mattered to who the buyer is, right? So I, I was smart enough to understand if I'm selling off to private equity, they don't want me as a partner. But to another agency who's trying to grow and grind just like we are, our, our technology is valuable, our team. Like all those things I mentioned, those four pillars earlier can mm-hmm. drive that multiplier uh, higher. Got it. So, so you thought it was worth six to 12 times EBITDA? Absolutely. And what was the LOI? Yeah, as a multiple of EBITDA. I, to be honest with you, it was like, um, I don't want to say it was like an insulting, but it was like, it just, nothing stood out. Like it, it just wasn't anywhere in the realm of, of what I was thinking. Um, and it didn't, it, it, none of it made sense. And, and I'm not trying to be vague, but it was just like, I think they just tried to see where I was at because the next conversation was, okay, you didn't like that. Where are you at? So it was almost like a tester. And I came hard. So like, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to walk out of this away from this without, I say six, but I probably wasn't going to take less than eight knowing that we'd settle Times somewhere. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go for 10 for 12. I'm going to settle on eight. I'm not going to six. So, so I kind of knew that, that floor for myself. And it was just, and, and again, I think that you, a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses talk about multiplier of EBITDA. I had a number in my mind that I wanted for myself and my partner and the, in the partnership moving forward, I almost didn't care what it was. I'm like, we just have to get to this number and we can slice and dice and negotiate any way you want and tell me it's two times EBITDA, 25 times EBITDA. I almost don't care. Here's where I'm at. Do you want to figure out how to get there or not? Kind of like how we operate with our customers, start with the end in mind and then work backwards and see if there's a conversation to be had. And fortunately for us and these guys, they saw the value. It was more value than just what's on paper. 
you know, they're getting my team, they're getting me, they're getting John, like we're, yeah. So the original LOI that you got, you, you had this number in your mind. You're like, it's not gonna, this is, this doesn't do it. Yeah. The original LOI, do you remember roughly, like I'm, I'm assuming it was below six times EBITDA. Do you remember like how much below? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the EBITDA number because what happened with the EBITDA number is, you know, everything's a negotiation. So when you sure. actually look at EBITDA, how you and I would view EBITDA on my company is going to be completely different, right? Because there's ad backs, there's people like if you're not caring for this cost, is that added back in EBITDA? So I think the, you know, I want to say the initial offer was like half of where we ended up, Okay. you know, ultimately. Okay. Okay. So, you know. So you got this number in mind that that you're happy with. Uh, they come in at yep. roughly less than half of that yeah. originally. Um, where does it go from there? Because so a lot of people would pound their fist on the table and say, you yeah, got to be kidding I me. I did. I did. <laughs> did you? I did. And Trust then like, me. yeah. So, so like that, yeah. Go ahead. So that's where, so that's where like this Todd Tasky guy from Toma Capital was, was a genius because he took the first hit. Like he took the hits, you know, like I look like, I, I kind of describe myself like I'm that, I'm that lion that can't be with other lions in the zoo because they put me in a little box because I'll just <laughs> and I just I, I hit him I let it out with him and he just through his experience and his negotiating like help me recognize where they're coming from and then help tee it up and then he would have the conversation with them like he was the mediator between it all you know he probably went back and said look you guys have one more shot because this guy is like don't waste his time because at this point what I didn't realize at the time you know, when you start to go down this road, like I've always thought about this since day one, selling the company and this, the time and the mental stress that this creates, because what it does, what it did for me, it made me question everything and really think at a different level, you know? And uh, so I spent a lot of time with Todd about all the, you know, where the bodies are buried and, 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 and everything. And it, it was sort of this exhilarating experience. And I mean, it got to the point where I said, if this deal doesn't go through, even if I would have spent a couple hundred grand to that point, um, I felt good because it was a good exercise for me to kind of just take a deep dive with myself to understand where I'm at as an entrepreneur. It, I asked it earlier, but I don't know that I got a clear sense. Was Todd, uh, so the name of the acquirer is Bell Media. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Was Todd engaged by Bell Media? to find acquisitions or was he, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear of who was paying his fee effectively. Uh, I, I, we ultimately paid his fee. Okay. So okay. we, so he was, we, at the end of the day became the seller. Okay. So we, we paid Todd the fee. That's helpful. And okay. So they come in with this offer. It's less than half of what you want. You're like, letting it out with Todd. Do you tell Todd your number at that point? Or do you just say, this isn't enough? do better. No, I, t I told him where my threshold was. Cause I said, otherwise, like you need to know what you're fighting for. I don't yeah. care how you do it or how you get there. But I felt to, to be fair for him, you know, I'm, I'm a real wear it on your sleeve kind of guy. And I just said, here's where I'm at either, either figure it out or don't, you know, and tell and whatever you need to do for the, you know, with these guys to get there, you know, cause I, I don't want to go back and forth and then be like, Oh, you know, you guys put all this time into it. And I'm going to keep rejecting it. I said, look, dude, Here's the good, better, best. So you gave him the good, like, better, do your best. Work. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I realized, and he I mean, he, he, he's, he, yeah, he's been through this a lot of times. Like the guy's got a lot of experience, so he knew how to lion tame me. He was really good at what he did because it's like it was mental warfare, mm -hmm. going back and forth, and you know, going through the negotiation of this. I mean, it was it was it was a mental mental game that he was really good at uh, consulting me on. Got it. Um, I realize we can't get to the actual number, but don't mind if I nibble at the edges a little bit. So mm -hmm. the, the good, better, best, help me understand yep. uh, where that sat. And again, I know that, that multiple of you does, you know, there's lots of interpretation, ad backs, et cetera, but yep. roughly speaking, the initial, you, in your mind, it was worth somewhere between six to 12 times you bid, uh, yep. um, and you went back to Todd and said, you know, it's got to, minimum's got to be this, this would be great. And this would be like a, a home run. <laughs> yeah. what, what multiples of EBITDA were we kind of talking about at the good, better, best scenarios? Um, 
six to eight and then 10 and then plus 10. I knew with this gotcha. deal, I wasn't getting over 10. Um, got it. Got it. So six to eight specific was a big deal. Yeah. Because I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot to other, there's a lot of other things to consider in this deal specifically. One being I was very hard on negotiating my term, which was I'm going to stay on the company for three years with a three year guarantee. Right. Obviously as a company with HLM, very successful, uh, very healthy salary as an executive and a, an employee of my own company. So I said, if I'm going to be an employee of this company, I negotiated a three-year term that I wasn't going to budge on. Because look, I don't know what the outcome could be. These guys could say, tomorrow you're fired. Thank you for your service up until this point. Outside of the conversations we had, I think they're great guys. But I was also like, this is going to secure me and, and get me all in HLM future growth not having to worry because I'm shifting from an entrepreneur of doing whatever I want to do at any given time to when well, now things are a little bit different, because even though I'm still an owner of this company, everything's very much ran as well. Now I'm a C level employee of the organization. So that was very different. And so I think a lot of that give and take in the negotiation came into that. So where I gave a little on maybe it was a multiplier of EBITDA was the, hey, I've got this, you know, sweetheart back end deal protecting, you know, the salary that sustains the lifestyle that I'm choosing to, to live. Um, yeah, and so, then also so a big say- kicker with this is we have a high level marketing, right? Like I built this brand, the baby, right? We are maintaining high level marketing as our brand company together. So they're ditching the Bell Media. We are now high level marketing. And that was a big thing for me because I'm like, even though you can't attach value to that, I'm like, you know, again, this is a, this to me is a stepping stone in my journey because I now feel when we sell this company for over a hundred million dollars at the second time, it's high level marketing. Like I still like, it's a, uh, th- that was really important to me. I, I didn't realize how important it was until I could reflect back. But the fact that we've maintained the name, maintained the integrity of all of our, like, it's really cool. Um, so it became, I don't want to say it became less about the multiplier and the money because me personally, and I think, again, every entrepreneur is unique. You could say, I got to you know, pound on the table and say, God damn, you know, we're, we're worth 12 EBITDA and we're not selling to that. Like I had a number in my head personally where, you know, look, I've got a home, I've got four kids, I've got things. And, you know, I wanted to be 100% debt free. I wanted a set amount of money over here. I wanted to fully fund my 529. Like I wanted a certain thing out of this that I'm like, if I could do this, I don't care what even it, like it didn't matter to me at that point because I'm like, if I could design this life where I'm a hundred percent debt free, I have a three-year guarantee of new company and I'm an equity partner in my own organization that we're continuing to grow, that we will grow for over a hundred K a hundred million. Sorry. Um, man, that's a, that, that was like a home run for me. Got it. So talk to me about the structure because you sold most of your shares, but then you, you rolled some of that equity into the new HL. Yes. So tell me about that. Yeah. So we took a big piece off the table in terms of cash, but Mm -hmm. then we, so when we took the cash and there was a responsibility, kind of put that cash back in the business. So how we approached this deal was, you know, let's take the majority of it in cash, put a little bit back in the business rolling forward. So I almost look at it as if you, if you cashed out completely, took this part of it, but then took the rest and invested in a new company, that's essentially what we did. And as an entrepreneur and as a human, like I just looked at it as if you have a big sum of cash, right? There's only so much money you need, right? I mean, there's only so much things that you need to, to live a lifestyle to, you know, support your family and you got vehicles, you have a house and, you know, we got a cottage. There's only so much money that is going to secure that. And then you have this excess cash. Well, what are you going to do with the excess cash? So my thought was I want to reinvest back into HLM, bet back on the company that I'm going to be driving essentially and being CRO of. So who's better to bet on than myself and what my capabilities are. So we, we did take a small portion of that and invested it back in the company. Did you, what proportion did you invest back in the company on a percentage basis? It was about 75, 25. So 75% of the 75 cash you took. Ca- 
cash off the table. Yeah. And then 25%, you rolled into this new entity. And and right. now you're a shareholder in the, the combined entity of high-level marketing, which right. is a company two, so, two and a half times. <clears throat> yep. So, yeah. So we were 6.5 million in revenue at the end of 2020. This year, combined company, we'll do a little over 18 million in revenue. Got it. And the goal is to sell at $100, so $100 million. Yep. Yep. And I, and, and that was one of the driving factors. Like I, I can see the, I can see a clear path to that now. Mm -hmm. If I would have stayed HLM where it was before, you know, we've always grown, but like I was getting really bored with this. Mm -hmm. Now I see the hockey stick, you know, growth. So for me, a big question was if I own 50% of my company today, but I can negotiate this design structure that I'm all in on yet own 10% of a larger company moving forward, that's a freaking home run for me. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah, exactly, no. that's exactly what we did. And also, I, I would it. say, going back to my original conversation about John, like I care about John. And I told John, I said, I'm going to get you the same deal. So we own 20% of the new company moving forward. Um, so I, I, I led this initiative. I fed him. Look, it was stressful, right? I fed him the details of which I felt he needed to know. And that was our relationship up until this point. I'm not going to get into the weeds and tell them everything, but I'm going to tell them the shit that I would want to know. Somebody leading this discussion and project over here. And I said, Hey man, we've had a great run and you know, this is the negotiations and where we're at and we can both secure 10% of new company moving forward. Here's the terms, you know, that number he told me that one day I got him more than that number. Oh, that's awesome. So that one day when he came to me and said, Hey, if I had this amount of money, I'm out. I got him more than that. So that was kind of a you, driver too. So I felt it was a win. And Wes, how did you ensure that when you got him that money that he didn't say, great, I'm out? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like, was there any part of that that we're like, yeah. we're going to lose our CTO here if, uh, if, we, if we cash him out too much? You know, one, at a personal level, I just, I know him. You know, I, I think when you spend a decade with somebody, you, you know a lot of the stress and the challenges, like this pulled that lever for him. And, you know, he's a mastermind developer and what I was able to architect and, and through conversations is he's now in his dream job, which he told me if I could lead our technology team that just works on product and cool technology, that's not in the day to day. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in heaven. And what I was able to do is now he has a team of five internal developers and they lead our product development team. So for me, I was also at that point where if he said, I'm good. I was at peace with that because we've had a great run and look, I want him to be happy. And if he's literally to that point, I'm like, look, I got it all to this point, make your own decision. Right. Uh, but I think I negotiated a pretty sweet term moving forward that now secures you for the next three years where you can kind of play in this playground and really take our technology to the next level. Um, so I felt I was able to achieve the best of both worlds. I was able to, to close up the, the, the old business but then present this really, really great opportunity by designing exactly what he wants moving forward for the next three years, you know? And obviously, I mean, we're yeah, three years is like that magic number, but like we're committed to this organization and we really want to be, you know, we're all in on this organization to, to, to really, to grow it. Yeah. To be clear, your three year uh, is an employment guarantee Correct. and your 10% uh, equity is equity separate retains whether whether your employee or not um yeah because look let's face it like in the end of three years there might be a situation where maybe i'm not the best cro or maybe sure. i'm just like look guys i don't want to do this anymore right and that's okay you know but now i but i, I feel right now where we're at the next three years is, is, is it's critical for us to be all in to get it to that this level like i already i already like i said i'm a, i build mental models and i build them in my head and i see them and i kind of grow to that I already see this in three to five years selling again for 75 to 125 million in revenue um, to either a larger partner or, you know, private equity. Got it. Um, when you went back to Todd and said, it's got to, this is good. This is better. This is best in terms of the number. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened next? What did they, did the acquire come back with a second LOI or what was the next step? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of filtering through Todd, Todd going back, but then also Todd's like, he would actually use me as a whiteboard and say, all right, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. And I would kind of give him feedback. We had this weird little, you know, relationship going 
and uh yeah went back i mean we probably went back three to four or five different times on the loi um and sometimes it was like obnoxious things like look like we want to lock some of this money up in escrow or we want to make sure this this and this happens and i'm like look you know you're you're buying it as is right like i can't control a client in six months if they fail like either do it or don't do it so those are like would, all these, I, yeah yeah those are some of the the, the, the kind of uh, details which were critical i'm curious though the first offer was sort of less than half of what you said was your number around half or whatever the next turn of the loi this the second if if you will version of it yeah. how much closer did it did it get to your number yeah i would say about 80 percent. okay it, it, yeah 80 percent. and then the um, third turn like when did you get to a point where it was it was there about the fourth or fifth loi it dialed in and in the last round about that we had like we all knew what it was going to be so when it was delivered to my email i knew exactly what it was going to say and i think the first couple of times we didn't have the, that deep a conversation. It was kind of like, well, let's throw this bait in the water and see if he bites it or how we, how they react. And so once we got to that final stage, like, I mean, Todd was really good to say, hey, like, where are you at with this? What's your final, like, what's your final number? Because I want to go back and I want to close this up because it did, I mean, the deal did get to a point where I'm like, I started to get irritated and said, this is distracting to me, right? Are we going to move forward in this deal or I got to just close this chapter? And it also came from them too. Like, look, is this guy screwing around? Or do we have a deal? Like, so, you know, it's kind of both sides managed through him. And then, and then we got how, there. How did you, you know, cause I think a lot of people, when they get a deal that they're like, eh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, they worry about pushing the acquire too hard, too far so much so that they're going to walk. Uh, four or five iterations of the LOI, like that's starting, like that's a lot of <laughs> back and forth. How did you get comfortable with the idea that you, you weren't going to push them over the edge, push them away, push them to the point where they're just like, you know, this guy's a lunatic. So this might sound weird, but I was trying to do that. I was trying to push them over the edge. Um, and there was a part in the negotiations where I completely, my feet turned a hundred percent cold. And I told Todd, I'm like, I, I, I don't think I can do this. You know, um, I had received feedback from like my existing COO, some other people that just got in my head and I, I completely turned a 180. My emotions took over and I said, what am I doing? Like, this is crazy. Um, so I told him, I said, Todd, I said, look, I said, this is cause I, I felt pressured to make a decision and I finally blew, I, I blew up and I said, look, this is a big decision you get a commission check at the end of this. This is my, my business. And I've spent a lot of years in this, not in quite those words. Um, I go, you need to back off and give me a couple of weeks. I'm going on a trip with my family. Maybe I can meditate or something will come to me. But I said, look, up until this point in my life, when I want to buy a car for my family or my, my wife, I'll buy it same day and it's delivered. Like I don't screw around. My decision making's fast. And I said, for this decision, I'm going to take two weeks because I don't want to make the wrong decision because this isn't buying a car. This is going to change the trajectory of a lot of people's lives, including my own. So they got pissed. They said, if this guy doesn't come back by Monday, we're walking. And I said, F you do whatever you want. I, I could care less. Like I said, I've already gotten so much value in learning through this. I'm like, now I'll be better prepared to go to the next one. Scott, the CEO of that company called me on Tuesday and this is what changed everything for me. He goes, hey, Wes, I, I know what you're going through. And I know it's extremely stressful. Uh, we've been through this three or four times. Because what really started to hit me hard was like, I'm about to be an employee of an organization I created to a certain degree. And that was I was starting to map that out. But he gave me a call and just like his tone and how we communicated. And I just knew right then and there, I said, dude, this is a, this is a guy that I trust, that I can prop up as CEO. I can build a really successful business with just the fact that he understood that to take a second to say, I don't want to rush you into any decision. Take as much time as you want. I know that Todd came back and said by Tuesday, like, or Monday, I'm not worried about that. Take as much time as you want. And I was like, you know what? Like that to me is who I am as a human being. And for him to recognize that it, it, it wasn't about EBITDA. It wasn't about this. It was like, 
I can partner with this dude because I know who he is now as a person. And that was huge. That was really huge for me. And again, I think the, the version that I'm coming from is a lot of my stake is rolling forward. If I was selling 100% goodbye, things are different. Negotiations are different. But where I'm at with this deal and everything, you know, how he communicated that with me was extremely important. So yeah, that was a big rolling, differentiating factor there. You're rolling 25% yeah. of the deal in. So this was mm-hmm. it, truly a partnership that you wanted to explore. Well, savvy move on behalf of your acquirer to give you a call directly. What's that? I'm sorry. I just said savvy move on behalf of your acquirer to call yeah. you directly. And yeah. Yeah. I think it just showed like, you know, I, I knew, I knew from that phone call, he probably doesn't know. I don't think I ever told him, but like from that phone call, it's like, yeah, we're going to grow this thing to a hundred million. Like this is the right partner. You know, private equity would just freaking pick us apart like vultures and bust the company up. And I care too much about the people. You know, I built a great team and I care a lot about the people and you know, I'm an what emotional their, guy. What was their reaction when you told me you sold the company? So I waited till the 11th hour because obviously I didn't want anybody to know. So being on Zoom, what I did is um, I told the leaders, you know, with the leadership group, I let them know. Um, it was, that was, you know, up until that point, we made decisions together. But this was one I'm like, look, like this is a decision I'm making as owner. And, you know, did a lot of the triage and the why. And they all kind of got it because they're all living day to day and understand the, the lack of resources and just what the opportunity is. Um, I, I jumped into everybody's Zoom meeting um, from each department and, uh, just kicked it off. And I think the benefit I had was I'm very transparent. I've been very honest and direct with my team from day one. And I think that that's one thing that people know and respect about me is I don't sugarcoat. I don't tiptoe. And I really just talked about the vision and the future. And I I think that, you know, I would say 90% of the people, like I could watch them nodding their heads and they're bought in. I mean, I had some some employees that have been there for eight, nine years that are like, I get it. Like we see it. You know, some people that are like, why are you doing this? And this is selfish and this is stupid and everything's great. Um, but again, I, I think the team, little does everybody know a lot of this was, I, I didn't feel great about the trajectory and where we were going as a company. Like I felt that at some point the bottom was going to fall out because the foundation wasn't sturdy. And so I think it's easy for an employee to look out and say, man, things are great. And, you know, you know, we just went through COVID and navigated through COVID, but like, I I just, I had a, I I didn't feel whole about that. So I think it's going to take some employees maybe a year. They're going to reflect back at some time and and they're going to look back and say, damn, this was one of the best decisions we ever made, which I've already gotten some of that feedback. You know, we had some turbulence. We lost a couple of people. You know, some people just felt this isn't for me or now since we're going to be with new company, now's that opportunity for me to jump ship. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I was, it was a conversation I was excited for and I'm glad I had it. And I felt very confident. And, um, you know, I reached out to somebody that was on the team that I, I probably haven't talked to since the merger and her recap yesterday was like, thank you so much for reaching out. It means a lot, but it's also really great to hear how bullish and how excited you are two months into the integration, it gives me a lot of, you know, uh, it gives me a lot of inspiration because it's been hard, you know, integration's hard, bringing two companies together. Very, very difficult. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, even though it's an emotional decision for me, it's a, it's a big, you know, look, you have employees that are used to a certain thing in a certain way. We've been a culture of change, but like change isn't easy for people. Like I I don't mind it, but I'm different. It's like but, that book, you know, Who Moved My people, Cheese? It's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, look, I, mean, I think I, there's I, a... And I, I, was really, I was really sensitive to that. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I've am i really grown as a leader, as a human being, to, like, put myself and be super empathetic and, like, look at it from their perspective. So I was very cognizant of, you know, eliminating a lot of those questions and fears. Because, look, like, I mean, obviously, like, new company, new CEO, like, the, and you hear merger, right? It's like merger, downsizing. It's like, no, no, this is for growth. Like every, like we need everybody on the team to make this a success. And it was my promise and commitment. And here we are two months later and, you know, we're, we're really, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Love it. Uh, Wes, where can people reach you? What's the, like, I, I mean, I know you guys are growing uh, yeah. 
HLM here. So I'm, I'm, there may be people listening to this that want to learn more about what, uh, what kind of marketing services you guys provide. Yeah, so sure. what's the best way to reach out? Yeah. So our website is highlevelmarketing.com, H-I-G-H levelmarketing.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I think I just updated my LinkedIn to now chief revenue officer of high level marketing. Uh, but you can always email me at West W E S at high level marketing.com. Um, awesome. you know, I, I love sharing the story, love diving in. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm part of EO entrepreneur organization. Um, I'm always here to, you know, to help other entrepreneurs. I think that's ultimately my goal is if I can help anybody through a tough situation or give experience share feedback based on what I've been through and it can offer any kind of value. That's really what gets me going. I think we've now talked for an hour and 20 minutes and it feels oh, like geez. we've only been talking for four minutes. So Says for me, you. it's like, this is where, <laughs> like, th this is where, you know, I feel like I, I love to share. I love to, you know, talk about the journey because if it can help anybody in any capacity, um, it's really what I love to do. Well, you've certainly helped a few people today. Thanks, Wes. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, if you like today's episode, you're going to love my new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. The book was inspired by the cohort of my guests over the years who have been able to negotiate an exit far better than the benchmark in their industry, sometimes two or three times more than I would have expected. I was curious to understand the tactics and strategies of these entrepreneurs and what they do differently from average performers. The result is a playbook for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. To learn more, go to builttosell.com slash selling, where we put together a collection of gifts for listeners who order the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Built to Sell Radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to builttosell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L 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 Thanks for listening.